always, always a blessing to worship with you guys and to be here in fellowship. I, um, I've said this before. We've been out here now a little over a year and a half. We've had the building for two and a half years, and it is every single day just an excitement and a joy to me and uh, to be here with you guys. Open, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 9. We are in part two of our series, The Sayings of Jesus. The Sayings of Jesus should really be called Some Sayings of Jesus because there are a lot of sayings of Jesus, and we're not going to cover them all this month, as you might have guessed. But last week we talked about traditions. This week we're talking about the heart. And uh, we're going to begin in Matthew 9. Here's what we have on tap today. Our theology today is this. Jesus is greater than the Old Testament law. Jesus is greater than the Old Testament law. This should not be a surprise for us. The book of Hebrews tells us that the, and Pierce just read some of the text for us, that the blood of bulls and goats could not make us clean, could not make us holy. What the blood of bulls and goats could not accomplish, Christ accomplished in fulfilling the law. And Christ is better than the law because he fulfills the law and is the answer to the law. Uh, The application today is this. It is the condition of our hearts and not the sum of our actions that makes us righteous. It is the condition of our hearts and not the sum of our actions that makes us righteous. And our prayer today is this. God set my heart to delight on the exaltation of Jesus rather than my own name or works. You'll remember last week, well, uh, that's spoilers, all right? So here's our, here's, our, here's our theology today. Jesus is greater than the Old Testament law. Pick up with me in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners were there and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, this is an interesting thing. We, we saw last week that uh, Jesus and his disciples minding their own business, and they were eating, and the disciples hadn't washed their hands, and then the Pharisees show up, and they say, hey, why aren't your disciples washing their hands before they eat? And now Jesus is eating with a tax collector, which would have been in first century Israel incredibly offensive because it was probably a Jew working for the Roman government, collecting taxes from the Jewish people, and then lining his pocket with a little bit extra. And, and so he's not only eating with uh, Matthew, the tax collector, Apparently, Matthew invited all of his friends over. You'll notice in verse 10, it says, many tax collectors were there. So it's like a tax collector luncheon with Jesus uh, and sinners. And so sinners is kind of a generic term. One of the things that I want you to remember is that this, uh, the, the gospel of Matthew is a Jewish text. We need to take it in a Jewish context. So th- there are two kinds of views of righteousness in the Bible. There is, uh, there is a Jewish view of righteousness that comes through works of the law. That if you do everything right, you'll be righteous. In fact, that's a paraphrase roughly of Ezekiel 18 that gives these list of rules that says if you do everything written in the law, you'll be righteous. The problem is not going to happen. None of us could do that, right? The Bible tells us that in Romans chapter 8. Uh, one of my favorite verses, for there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But it goes on in the next two verses to say, for what the law couldn't accomplish because of our weak flesh, Christ did. In other words, we were so weak and pathetic, we couldn't ever do all the law. Christ did it for us, okay? And so two views of righteousness. The Jews had a view of righteousness that if you do all the right things, you're righteous. But when Paul talks about righteousness, he talks about our faith in Jesus, that we have believed in Christ. In fact, in Philippians chapter 2, it says that we have now received a righteousness, a righteousness which comes from God through faith. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin to be a sin offering on our behalf, that we could become the righteousness of God. And so righteousness now is a matter of faith. It's a matter of what we believe and what we know about Jesus Christ. But the reason that I point that out to you is this. Jesus makes these two statements At the end of verse 12 and the end of verse 13, those who are well do not need a physician or a doctor, but those who are sick do. And then he says at the very end of verse 13, I came not for the righteous, but the sinners. So we have these two uh, parallel statements. I'm not here for the well. I'm here for the sick. I'm not here for the righteous. I'm here for the sinners. Now, it's an interesting thought because literally no one is righteous apart from faith. No one. So what does Jesus mean by this when he says, I'm not here for those who are well. I'm not here for the righteous. He's talking about the Pharisees who believe themselves to be righteous because of all the works they're doing. 
They believe themselves to be righteous. At this point, uh, there are people who have put faith in God, people of the Old Testament. Abraham, the Bible tells us, has put faith in God. David has put faith in God. There were certainly people who put faith in God. But this idea of righteousness, you might remember in Matthew 5 that Jesus says it's the poor in spirit who inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's the poor in spirit. It's those who believe that they don't have anything to bring to the table. It's those who believe that they're destitute. It's those who believe in this case that they are sick and that they are a sinner that Christ says, I'm here for you. We talked last week about how sometimes people have this idea. In fact, we have this idea because many of us were taught this as kids, that you have to present your best face before God, that you have to be in your best clothes, that you have to be in your best garments. In fact, uh, we, the joke all growing up was that, that you can fight all the way to church, but once you walk into church, you got to put on your happy face. And I just want you to know something right now, that you don't have to be well to come to Jesus. We come to Jesus because we are precisely unwell. We don't have to be righteous to come to Jesus. We come to Jesus because we are unrighteous, because we are sinners. And we come and we find wellness. We find righteousness in Christ. And so Christ is saying to the Pharisees who are mad that Jesus is eating with a tax collector, and many tax collectors, uh, and that Jesus is eating with sinners, they're like, why is he doing this? Does he not get it? And Jesus goes, look, I'm not here for you. I'm here for these guys. I'm here for the people who are unwell sinners. Because the problem here, and this is what Jesus says to him. Look at what he says at the end of verse 12. Jesus says, those who are well do not need a doctor, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. So this is his statement to the Pharisees. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is, this is a scathing statement by Christ to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were people who knew the Bible. Okay, They knew the scripture. And Jesus here is quoting Hosea 6. We'll get to it in just a moment. But Jesus is quoting Hosea 6 when he says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And then when Jesus, he's addressing the Pharisees, said, I came not for the righteous, but for the sinners. What Jesus has just said is to the Pharisees, I'm not here for you. I'm here for these people you despise. I, I'm, not, I'm not all about the sacrifice. I'm about mercy. The, the Old Testament, the Hebrew will, will use steadfast love instead of mercy, but the idea is the same. God is about the heart. He's about the condition of the heart rather than he is about the sacrifice and, and all the law and all the works of the law. Here's the thing that's interesting about this. Jesus has always, God has always been concerned more with the heart than he has been with the action. Real action flows out of a correct heart, but actions don't change the heart, okay? We get that backwards a lot of times. We, have a lot of, we, we think a lot of times that if I just do the right thing enough, eventually I'll love God. If I just do the right thing long enough, maybe my marriage will be okay. If I just do the right thing long enough, maybe my relationship with my kids will be better. None of that gets better without a heart being changed. And Christ says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I am concerned with the heart of the matter more than I am with the actions. Flip over a couple of pages to Matthew chapter 12. So the Pharisees are mad. He's eating with tax collectors and sinners. Last week they were mad because the disciples ate with unwashed hands. Look at Matthew 12, beginning in verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. So pause here really quickly. Jesus and his disciples walking through the grain fields, they want a snack, right? So they're picking heads of grain, and they're eating them. Now, according to the Jewish law in Exodus and Leviticus, we see this, that if you were walking through somebody else's vineyard or somebody else's grain field, you were allowed to pluck something from it to eat. If you owned the field, it was a way that you could serve the people who were passing through. But the law said you couldn't put anything into a basket. So basically, you can't go shopping in their field, right? You know, you're not feeling, these grapes look really good, and you take home a whole basket of grapes. But you could walk through and eat some of their grapes or eat some of their figs. So that's not the problem. The problem that the Pharisees have is that they're doing this on the Sabbath day when you're supposed to be resting. The problem that the Pharisees have is essentially they're going, Jesus, why are your disciples harvesting? That's the problem. They're harvesting on the Sabbath. And look at what Jesus' response is. He goes, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and he ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, but only for, or for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Let me give you the story really quickly. In 1 Samuel, I forget if it's 20, 21, it's right in there somewhere. Uh, David is fleeing from King Saul. King Saul wants to kill David. And David and his men come to the temple, okay? 
And when they get there, well, there's no temple yet. It's the tent of meeting. When they get to the tent of meeting, David says, do you have any food here for us to eat? And the priests say, well, we've only got the bread that we, that we put in the presence of God. The priest every day would lay bread out in the presence of God on a table. And then the next day they would change that bread out for new bread. And the day old bread uh, would go to the priest as food. And it was, it was part of their pay, if you will, for working in the tabernacle. But it was only lawful for the priest to eat. So they say, well, we only, have, we only have the consecrated bread. We only have the holy bread. David goes, cool, I'll eat that. By law, by Jewish law, he's not supposed to eat it. Only the priests are. And so here Jesus is, his disciples, walking through the grain field, eating heads of grain. Pharisees are ticked. How dare your guys break the Sabbath by plucking heads of grain? And Jesus goes, do you not remember what David did? And what, the reason Jesus brings that up is because the Pharisees aren't mad at David. They're not angry at David. David broke the law, very clearly broke the law, and they're not upset about it. And it's like, do you not remember what David did? You, you don't have a problem with that, but you got a problem with my guys? They didn't have a problem with Jesus' disciples. They had a problem with Jesus. Look at this in verse 6. Have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? So here's what he's saying about that. On the Sabbath day, the priests still have to make offerings. They'll make offerings in the morning. They'll make offerings in the evening. They'll have to bathe themselves. They'll do ceremonial washings. They'll take the, the pieces of the offering that were not to be offered to God, and they'll have a priest carry those outside the camp or outside the city and burn them in a burn pile out there. They're making an anointing oil that they would anoint everything with. They're baking the consecrated bread. They're working on the Sabbath. And Jesus goes, you don't have a problem with that. Like, Jesus, like, I don't know. He's, he's a little snarky. Like, he just kind of, like, just cuts right to it, you know? He's like, oh, you got a problem with my guys plucking a few heads of grain, but you're okay with David and the priests. And then he says this. Listen to what he says. Verse 6, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. Himself. Jesus is better than the temple. And then what's he going to say to them? And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. If you knew and you understood what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you wouldn't have condemned the guiltless. That's really key. We talked about it a little bit last week with traditions, that sometimes our traditions take a greater place in our heart than Jesus does, and we love our traditions more. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes we're willing to condemn the guiltless because we don't like the way that they do things. And Jesus goes, no, 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 look, I'm, I'm better than the temple. I'm better than the Old Testament priest. I'm better than David. And he goes, you don't get to tell me that what we're doing is wrong because I'm better than those things. Jesus, reckon, revealing himself as God, he goes, I, if you understood, listen to what he says, if you understood what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. So he's quoting this text again, Hosea 6. He's quoting it for a second time in just a matter of a few pages. So he tells them, look, you've got a problem that I'm eating with tax collectors and sinners. And the fundamental reason that you have a problem with that is because you don't understand I want mercy and not sacrifice. He goes, not only that, you have a problem with my guys plucking heads of grain. You have a problem with my guys plucking heads of grain. And you know why? It's because you don't understand I want mercy and not sacrifice. He's telling the Pharisees that they have a fundamental misunderstanding, and the Pharisees are more concerned with the types of Jesus, people Jesus is hanging around with or whether or not he's observing the Sabbath according to their prescription. And what Jesus is concerned with is mercy, is love. Now, I want to point out something to you, and I'm going to point this out every time there's a Pharisee in our story. When I grew up, when I grew up in church, I heard preachers I don't know how many times, a lot, because I was in church all the times, right? So Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, if you could be at church, we were there. And, and so I don't know how many times I heard preachers say it, but I heard a lot of preachers say something like, listen, some of you behaved like Pharisees this week. Some of you were Pharisees this week. Hear me say this, Christian, if you have put faith in Jesus Christ, that's why I called you Christian, okay, same thing. If you've put faith in Jesus Christ, you are not a Pharisee. The Pharisees denied Christ. Nicodemus accepted, okay? The Pharisees denied Christ. The Pharisees are not examples of bad Christians. The Pharisees are examples of people who have not put faith in Jesus, who play at religion. People who look religious, people who walk the walk, look the role, but have no relationship with God. 
These are the people who will ultimately have Jesus crucified, okay? These are not people who believe in Christ or have put faith in Christ. You and I are not Pharisees, okay? We, we're going to get something wrong, to be sure. We'll get something wrong, but you are not Pharisees. You're a Christian who got something wrong. Big difference there, all right? We can talk more about that on Wednesday if you would like. Keep reading in Matthew 12, 9. Jesus went on from there and entered a synagogue, the place where they were teaching the scriptures on the Sabbath. And a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So check this out. Isn't it funny that the Pharisees, like, they're at the dinner too. They're, con they're condemning Jesus for being there with the tax collectors and the sinners, but they're there too. And I just wonder how that conversation goes later. I can't believe he's hanging out with the tax collectors and sinners. Well, how did you know he was doing that? Well, we were at the same dinner. Well, <laughs> you're like, no, no, no. We were just there to see if he was with the tax collectors and sinners. You know, you ever met people like that? We weren't there to do what they were doing. We were just there to see if they were doing what we thought they were doing. You know, that's what, and now the Pharisees are following. Do they have nothing better to do than to follow Jesus and his disciples? I can imagine one guy pulling out his ledger, 14 grains into his mouth on the Sabbath, you know, and they're just following him around. And Jesus is just like ripping them to shreds. And they follow Jesus into the synagogue. And here's a guy with a withered hand, a shriveled up hand. And so now they're going, okay, okay, we heard you. We heard what you said. David can eat the bread that's only for the priest. Okay, all right. So you're, the priest can work on the Sabbath. And then they said this, how about healing a man? Can you heal a man on the Sabbath? Is that lawful? They don't believe that it is. They do not believe that it is. Is it lawful to heal a man on the Sabbath? Here's why they ask. Here's the motive, the end of verse 10, so they can accuse him. Catch this. They are hoping Jesus will heal a man on the Sabbath, not so they can glorify his name, so they can accuse him about breaking the Sabbath. That's what they're hoping will happen. And the reason that their hearts are so twisted up is because they don't understand God wants mercy and not sacrifice. They're more concerned with how someone looks on the Sabbath than they are that a man would be made whole. They're missing the mercy. They're missing the love. They're all about obeying the Sabbath. So Jesus says this. They say, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They're asking him so they can accuse him. He said to them, which of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on a Sabbath. Jesus asked them, if you had a sheep that fell into a pit on the Sabbath, what are you going to do? He goes, you're going to lift it out. They can't deny that. Of course they would lift it out, right? And he goes, isn't a man more valuable than a sheep? Now Jesus is wanting to put them, put the screws to them a little bit. Because if they say it's not lawful, they're saying that their sheep is more valuable than, than a human soul. Right? And why? Why would they even be in that spot? Because they're, they care more about sacrifice than they do about mercy. They care more about the letter of the law than they do the gospel of grace. Jesus says, so it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched out his hand, and it was completely restored, healthy like the others. Verse 14, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Man, if you're wondering, like, how do we know that the Pharisees aren't representative of bad Christians? They're trying to destroy Jesus. And a Christian is proclaiming him as God. <laughs> Their whole aim is, they're, they're, I just want this guy to be dead. That's their whole thought about Jesus. They're constantly trying to find ways. And what are they doing? They're not trying to find ways to condemn him in his grace and his mercy. They're trying to find ways to condemn him according to the law. You don't observe the Sabbath. It's why the guys come to him and show him a coin later and say, who should we pay taxes to? To God or to Caesar? And they're always trying to trap him with the law. Why? Because they're not about the heart. They're about performance. That brings us to our application. It is the condition of our hearts and not the sums of our, sum of our actions that makes us righteous before God. It is the condition of our hearts and not the sum of our actions that makes us righteous before God. I want to point out something to you because I think it's a very funny picture. The Bible says that the Pharisees would enlarge their phylacteries. So we probably, we don't use that word anymore. They had boxes strapped to their heads with the scriptures inside that they had memorized. And the fact that they were enlarging their phylacteries meant they were trying to be impressive about how many verses they had memorized. That's wacky. 
Can you imagine some guy strapping his Air Jordan shoebox, you know, like to his head just to be like, hey, look at me. I, I, could, I went to college with some guys, and unfortunately, I was probably this guy for a number of years that would have done that. Like, you know, just, I just want people to know how much I know. You know what I mean? Anybody? Any, yeah? Ever? Bueller? Bueller? Anybody? Anyway, like, you, you just kind of, these guys were wearing bigger boxes, and I just, I, I have to wonder that when Joe Schmo Pharisee comes out one day, and he's gone home and made himself a bigger box, if, like, his buddy Sam's like, huh, all right, if that's how he's going to do it, you know, and he comes back the next day with a bigger box, you know, they're getting, like, really muscular necks because they're having to support it, and the other thing is, the Bible says that they, they had long tassels, it's a really obscure reference. It's only mentioned once in, in the, the Bible. It's mentioned in Numbers chapter 30, I believe, verse 15, but don't hold me to that. Um, don't, for real. It might be 1530, but it's somewhere in there. Uh, and it talks about making tassels on the, the edges of your garments as a symbol of what God had done. And how he'd, And I just imagine these guys walking around, the Pharisees walking around with long tassels. Oh, I see your tassels aren't as long as mine. <laughs> You know, but your phylactery is really pristine. You know, like, I mean, just, right? And, and then what they would do, then what they would do is that the Bible tells us in Matthew 6 that anytime they gave offerings, they would give offerings with trumpets so that people would know, would be aware that they're giving an offering. As of yet, we have a little offering box in the corner. I've not heard a trumpet. Keep that up, all right? No need for the trumpets, all right? Your seventh grade student learning the trumpet, bring them, but it's okay. We don't need that, right? So, so here's the thing. Not only would they do that, they would stand on the corner and they would pray loudly so that everybody could see them. I always imagine they waited till like rush hour or whatever rush hour is in Jerusalem. So here's the picture I want you to get. The Pharisees are walking around going, I'm well, I'm righteous, I'm better than you. They've got their long tassels, they've got their phylacteries, they've got their band, and they're waiting for rush hour, standing on the street corner so everybody can see them. And they believed that they were the picture of righteousness. And here's the kicker. Society bought into it and believed they were the picture of righteousness, and society thought, we're never going to make it. We can't ever be as righteous as those guys. And then Jesus shows up and says, I'm not here for them. I'm here for everybody who says, I'm unwell, and I'm a sinner. And everybody was like, awesome. <laughs> That's me, <laughs> you know? Like, I can't be as righteous as the Pharisees seem to think they are, but I can be an unwell sinner. And Jesus goes, perfect. We're, we're a team. We're a match, right? And the Pharisees, the problem with them was they were concerned about the appearance, how they looked. They were concerned more about how they looked and how they were perceived than they were the souls of people. More concerned about how they looked and how they were perceived than the withered hand of a man. Look at this. This is from Luke. It gets even worse. This is from Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 10. Now, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Man, the Pharisees really hated how Jesus used the Sabbath. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten herself up. Let me give you the situation. There is a woman who, because of a demonic spirit, has been bent in half, another translation says, for 18 years. Because of a demonic spirit, bent in half for 18 years. It's the Sabbath day, and Jesus says to her on, in verse 12, When Jesus saw her, he, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hand on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Praise God. That is beautiful. That is incredible. That is powerful. It's because Jesus cares more about mercy than sacrifice. And then listen to this, verse 14. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant, angry, ticked off, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the crowd, there are six days in which work should be done. Come on those days to be healed, but not the Sabbath. Catch this. A woman demonically oppressed for 18 years, bent in half, and Jesus goes, you're free from that, and touches her, and she stands up straight for the first time in 18 years. And the synagogue ruler, rather than rejoice, similar to Matthew 12 with the guy with the withered hand, says, listen, everybody, there are six days we can do work. Come on those days to get healed, but not on a day like today. That's not a guy who's concerned with mercy, is it? It's not a guy who's concerned with love. That's a guy who's concerned with the letter of the law. Listen to what Jesus says to him. You hypocrites. Here, ah, side note, not time. It's okay. 
you hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox and his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, huge, very key, very important phrase, we don't have time to talk about right now. You can come talk to me about it later or Wednesday. And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 years, be loose from the bond on the Sabbath day? He said all these things as his, as, as his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at the glorious things done by him. So he says, you guys are hypocrites. You'll untie your donkey or your ox and lead it to the water so it can drink. But this woman who's a child of God, a daughter of Abraham, who's been bound by Satan, it's not okay to set her free? See, the Pharisees, the synagogue rulers, were concerned with the letter of the law only so far as it served their need. They're going to rescue their own lamb from a pit. They're going to lead their own ox to the water. But when it boiled down to it, what they wanted to do is condemn Jesus and make themselves righteous. They wanted to be viewed as righteous. Their hearts were never right. We talked last week about traditions and customs and how a lot of times we'll be divided with other Christians because their traditions and customs are different than ours. Maybe we didn't do the Lord's Supper today the way you've always seen it done. And you're like, oh, they could do that better. Look, we probably could. We don't have a lot of room in here. There's probably a dozen different ways that we could do it. But that's not the point. The point isn't the form of it. The point isn't the sacrifice of it. What's the point of it? The heart that we're proclaiming the death of Christ until he comes. And, and, and what, what does this have to do with us? What does this have to do with us if, if we're not the Pharisees, if we're Christians, if we're not Pharisees? Here's what it has to do with us. Because false teaching comes into the church. It does all the time. Bad theology trickles into the church all the time. Paul says this in the Galatian church, to the Galatian churches. In Galatians chapter 3, he says, Who bewitched you? Who tricked you? Who fooled you? He goes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified in front of your eyes. He goes, did you begin by the Spirit? In other words, did you get righteousness by the Spirit or by works? The answer is spirit, faith, every time. We are righteous, we are holy, we are loved, we are forgiven, we are adopted into the family of God because of our faith in Jesus and what he has accomplished. Every time, it's the spirit and faith. And he says this to the Galatians in chapter 3 of Galatians. He says, having started by the spirit, then why do you think it's all about you now? And somewhere along the way, preaching in, in the American church often, not always, but often takes this form. You can't save yourself. You need to put faith in Jesus. So far, so good. You can't save yourself. You need to put faith in Jesus. You're a sinner who needs a Savior. Here's Christ. Here's the cross. Here's the empty tomb. So far, so good. And then all the rest of the sermons go, and here's the hundred things you need to do. Now that you've put faith in Jesus, here's the hundred things you need to do. Guys, having started by the Spirit, having started by the grace of Christ, guess how it is that we continue to move forward? By the Spirit and the grace of Christ. It, it wasn't that we needed mercy and steadfast love yesterday, but today's about the law. It was that we needed mercy and steadfast love yesterday, and today we still need mercy and steadfast love, right? Today we still need to be more concerned with the souls of men and women than we do the letter of the law. Today we need to be more concerned with a God who loves people and cares for people. There are people that you are going to encounter today unless you go home and lock yourself in a closet. There will be people you encounter today. If it's no one but your own family who need the love and the mercy and the grace of God. They just do. Now twice, Jesus has said to them, I wish you understood what this means. I need mercy and not sacrifice. Let me read to you quickly where this comes from in Hosea 6. We don't have a lot of time left, so I'll read it fast and try to explain it. In, in Hosea 6, it's, God says this, I desire steadfast love. That's the Hebrew version. The Greek version of the Old Testament says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Here's what he wants. I desire love and mercy, not sacrifice, not a ram on an altar. I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. He goes, what I really want you to do is to know me. Now, it appears, it appears here that they do, but I need you to catch this. At the end of chapter 5, at the end of chapter 5, here's what God says to Israel, this, this rebellious kingdom. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, I'm in 513 if you're a note taker. Then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the great king. 
but he is not able to cure you or heal your wound. God says, I will be like a lion to Ephraim, like a young lion to the house of Judah. I will tear and I will go away. I will carry off and no one will rescue you. I will return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. Here's what God says. Israel, you've rebelled against me. And now you've turned to the king of Assyria for help? No, you should have turned to me for help. You should have come to me. So now I'm going to be like a lion, and I'm going to rip you to pieces, and I'm going to leave you in a mess. And then I'm going to return to my place, my throne, and I'm going to wait for you to recognize what you've done. And when you call out to me with a genuine broken heart, then I'll deal with it. Then I'll come and respond. Now listen, it sounds like in chapter 6 that they got it right. So they say, their response is, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us, but he will heal us. He, will, he has struck us down, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. So it sounds like they got it right. Let us return to the Lord. He'll heal us. He'll bind us up. But listen to what Jesus says, or what God says, rather. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. I have hewn you with the prophets. I've cut you up with the prophets. I've slain you by the words of my mouth. My judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offering. But they, like Adam, transgressed the covenant. They dealt faithfully, faithlessly with me. Gilead is the city of evil doers tracked with blood as robbers lie and wait for a man so the priests band together they murder on their way to Shechem they commit villainy in the house of Israel I have seen horrible things Ephraim's whoredom is there Israel is defiled for you also O Judah a harvest of judgment is appointed here's what God says he's like man I've torn you to pieces what I really want is your heart and not your sacrifice and the people are like yeah yeah we'll come back to God if we come back to him he'll fix us up and he's like no no, no I, I get it he goes, don't you know that I get it? Don't you know that I see your heart? He goes, you're set on villainy. You're set on wickedness. You're set on turning. Here's what Jesus is doing. Here's what God is saying in this statement. Here, I desire love and not sacrifice. These people are coming to him. The Bible says it in a couple of places this way. It says it in Isaiah. It says it in Matthew. We looked at that last week. Their lips are close to me, but their hearts are far from me. With their mouths, they're saying the right things, but their hearts aren't there. I've given you the example before of once when my dad left us when we were kids. He came back after about two and a half months, uh, tail between his leg, sort of, you know, and, and came back. And when he walked into my bedroom, he knocked on my door, came into my bedroom. I didn't want to see him. Not, came into my bedroom and he says, your mom says I'm supposed to tell you I'm sorry, so I'm sorry. Shut the door and walked away. I, I got to tell you, that didn't do anything for me. The words out of his mouth were right, but the heart was not. You know, the Bible tells us in Joel chapter two, that, that those who have rejected God, this isn't us. This is Joel two. It's a specific situation. But the, the prophet Joel says, calls to the people and says, rend your heart and not your garments. It was a Jewish practice that whenever somebody was heartbroken, they would just rip their shirts. They would just Superman or Hulk themselves, you know, like incredible Hulk. You know, people are walking around all the time with torn pants and shirts. I don't know. Right. And so it's just like they would rip their clothes. Like I'd have to like, I don't know, like. I don't know if they were shoddily made or whatever. But anyway, they're ripping their clothes all the time whenever they're sad. God says through the prophet Joel, he says, no, 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 that's not what I want. I want your heart to be broken. Somebody's walking down the road with torn clothes. You're like, oh, they're sad. But maybe they just look sad. Maybe their heart's not broken at all. God wants mercy and not sacrifice. Listen, here's the lesson we take from it. We don't want to be like the Galatians who started by the Spirit and then turned to our own works. We don't, we don't want to be those people who look right. We want to be the people whose hearts are right. We, we need to be less concerned with how the world looks at us, whether or not we're dressed okay, whether or not we did the Lord's Supper okay, whether or not we do church okay. And we need to be more concerned that our hearts are bent on knowing God. That's one of the things, one of the main things that the 456 Church is about. We want to be a group of people who are bent on knowing God. You and I are going to disagree on a lot of different things. Thank God that he is about mercy and not sacrifice. That's what he's about. Mercy and not sacrifice. We're going to get a lot wrong. Thank God he is about mercy. 
Our prayer today is this, God set my heart to delight on the exaltation of Jesus rather than my own name or works. The Pharisees delighted in themselves. They did not delight in Jesus. The Pharisees were concerned with how everybody viewed them. They were not concerned with the glorification of God. The Pharisees were concerned with whether or not the Sabbath was being observed, not whether or not someone was healed, not whether or not someone was released from a de demonic oppression. We aren't Pharisees. We're neither Galatians. But we are people. And sometimes we forget that the heart of God is mercy and not sacrifice. Take just a moment to ask God to set your heart rightly on him today. Lord God, we love you so much. We thank you so much, God, for your grace to us. We thank you, God, so much for your love and your kindness towards us. We thank you, God, that it was not our sacrifice, it was not our work, it was not our effort that brought us into a right place with you, but that it was the gracious work of Jesus Christ. We ask, God, that you would set our hearts on you. Lord, that we would be people who are more concerned with mercy and steadfast love than we are with sacrifice. God, that we would show people your grace and your mercy that you've shown to us. God, that we'd be more concerned with the souls of men and women who don't yet know you, who need healing, who need rescue. And that God, that we who started off saying we are unwell and we are sinners, that God, that dependency that we had on you at the beginning, we would continue to have on you you day in and day out, that we would be reminded that it was not just the cross for our salvation, but it is the cross for our daily living. It's not just the empty tomb for our future in heaven. It is the empty tomb for tomorrow and the rest of today and for every breath we'll draw next. For your grace, for your glory, we pray these things.